So, hey everybody, and welcome to Choose Stream. I'm so glad to kind of get reconnected with my buddy John Hardesty and, of course, my co host, Masei Seki. Thank you so much for being here, guys. This is a wonderful kind of space where we could talk about art and life as an artist. And, of course, uh, who is our guest today? John Hardesty has done fine art for, you know, decades. Decades? Two decades? Uh, yeah, Almost. one point, 1.5-ish. 1. 1. 1.5-ish. <laughs> but uh, telling by his artwork, you cannot tell. It looks like decades and decades. So uh, a big welcome to Jonathan Hardesty. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Glad to be here. It's always fun, man. Right on. And um the artwork that you're going to be seeing we have a little treat for you it is jonathan hardesty's painting uh so thank you so much for doing the painting as well oh yeah it was fun and i i told bobby too guys i i was doing uh a painting for the stream and uh the software that i was using to capture the video totally crashed so this was number two so obviously i needed more practice so the first one the first one went pretty good, and this one I, I, I did a second probably late at, late at night. It was pretty, I don't know what time it was, it was pretty late, but this is my son Sam, and uh, this was a picture I took of him. I was setting up for another reference photo that I was going to use, and he was my model so I could set the the exposure and make sure the lighting was okay, and so this was his, his I'm doing this for dad face. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. And uh, and I thought it would be fun to paint him, too. I, anytime I get the chance to paint my family, I, I try to do it. I love it. The background there, it looks very kind of – it lines up almost perfectly so there could be kind of like a grid kind of thing of yeah. measuring. Is that oh, on yeah. purpose? Or, oh, okay. I guess not. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, it does. Well, that actually – so in my studio – when I when I moved into this house, um, I I redid my the studio. He the guy was a welder and um, did some other things. So, uh, so he had uh, basically a big garage out back, and so I made it climate controlled and all that. But the the one wall that he had that it actually has been very very useful to me as a painter is the the pegboard wall. So that's what he was standing in front of, and I, I have so many things hanging on there, and it's great. It's like a huge wall to a huge wall. It's just all pegboard, so I could probably hang like 4,000 tools on there or something. <laughs> ah, so you use it. it to organize your tools. Yeah, yeah. Well, I use it for like, for different things like uh, stretcher bars or, yeah, like uh, like different tools. And then if I have uh, canvases that need to dry, I can hang them up there. Uh, I've got, yeah, just a bunch of a bunch of uses for it. You buy those, you know, metal bracket things and you can you can store uh, store a ton of stuff up there. It's really good. I also seen some people where they would outline the brush or whatever that they put in a specific place <laughs> so that they know how to put it back. That's funny. I do that with my car tools. And it's funny because I'm selectively, uh, what's the word? Uh, I'm selectively fastidious or I, I'm, I'm organized in a very selective way. So there's certain things that I'm not organized with at all and that frustrates my wife. <laughs> But certain things like that with my tools for working on the car and things like that, I did that. I outlined with a Sharpie. And, but what <laughs> happens sometimes is I'm working on something and then they're on the table and it's kind of pointless that there was an outline. But at least I know it'll go back there eventually. <laughs> yeah, it has a little home for, it, yeah. for itself. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's now, would right. you consider yourself like an organized person, John? No. No? Uh, I've had to become that way in order to... to um, to succeed or do better because it it was interesting i was just talking about this uh, talking to a student about this the other day and they were struggling because they were coming to grips with a certain kind of personality trait that they had and they had to conquer it in order to go further with their art and i really feel like that's the way it is with everyone i, I think you know whatever your weaknesses are it, it shows up when you start pursuing something especially i feel like with art because i guess i know art more than anything else but but it, it started to expose my lack of organization. My I didn't finish things well when I first started. I was unfocused. And a lot of things like that that I had to really conquer those things personally while I was also learning art in order to get better. So it was interesting. Well, I was the exact same way. You know, I have an older brother. 
And, you know, I was just saying, I got to stop saying, you know, and I just said it freaking like three times. So I apologize about that. Dude, it's dude, it's really hard. I have a sign just just so everybody knows out there that when you actually stop and you have to speak and you have to collect your thoughts and, and relay them, especially if you want it to be in a more relaxed way. It's very, very difficult to not fill the gaps. Yes. And mm -hmm. and I say, you know, all the time. And when I'm editing my videos for the schoolism classes, I go through and I cut out all these you knows, and it's really frustrating. So I have a sign, and Bobby had told me, uh, you had brought that to my attention a while back, and so I put a little sign up on my desk, and it said, and everybody that comes to my studio says, why does it say on your desk, don't say you know? <laughs> <laughs> they think I'm trying to be humble. They think I'm like, I'm trying to be humble. I'm trying to, you know, act like I, or, or, I, or they're assuming that I, I think I know everything, I guess, you know, <laughs> oh, but it's, it's just more just a, a filler times there too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But what I wanted to say was, uh, I have a brother and growing up, he was always the much more organized one. And I was the much more chaotic one. You know, my, uh, my room was always very messy. <laughs> it was always very messy. So same thing like you, I had to learn to get organized now. Mm. If you could give, if you could kind of snap your fingers and have your kids take a certain trait for organizing, being more organized, you know, or a habit, what would that be? Ooh, if I could give it to my kids, you mean? Yeah, if you can snap your fingers and they will start, that would be a lesson that they would take with them for the rest of their lives. Hmm. Well, I to think help Sam, them organize. yeah, I think for Sam, his issue is going to be very close to me. That's who I'm painting here. I think his issue will be close to mine, which is focus. I think he, he likes quite a few things and I see a lot of the, that, the early signs that showed up in me showing up in him. So I think I would give him focus because I think he enjoys being organized and I do too. It's just a matter of being focused and, and prioritizing the right way. But I, I actually do like it when my things are organized <laughs> and everything's where it should be. It's, it's, it's a good comforting feeling. <laughs> I like it, but I just get too caught up thinking about other things and not prioritizing the right way. So I'd give that to him. Violet, I would, uh, I, I think she, she is pretty messy too. She's pretty, pretty messy. She's going to need to be a little bit more conscientious, I guess is the right word. Or she, she just will throw her clothes on the floor <laughs> and that kind of a thing. So, but I think she'll learn that too. Cause I think she, she also won't want to pay the price. And then, then when I, we make her clean it up, it's this big, huge hassle for her. So I think she'll learn that that it's not worth it. I think That's one it. of the best practices I've adopted is doing my to-do list the day before. That way, you know exactly what you need to do coming right. straight into the studio. You know, you don't need to, Good. uh, mess around and make coffee extra long and, you know, talk right. to people extra long and that, that kind of thing. Totally. That's always been very helpful. What about you, Masse? I was actually just thinking the same thing. I was thinking like, what, what have I adopted? Like ever since I started working here, I know like, you know, artists, we have so many things we want to do, like, you know, what we want to study, mm -hmm. what kind of projects we want to start on next or like which classes we have. And then, uh, when I started working here, you taught me the to-do list and you kind of wrote like, you know, if there's big tasks, make them more like bite-sized, bite-sized mm -hmm. like tasks. And then once I, you know, use the whole coloring, um, you know, uh, oh my gosh, I'm saying, you know, now, now that you mention it. It's all right. Um, <laughs> it's all right. Don't worry about it. Don't but beat yourself yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> so whatever is more important, you highlight it in a warmer color. And once, once you're finished with that, um, you fill it in with a cooler color and it's much more satisfying and also like you feel more, um, I guess accomplish. It's like a lot more accomplishing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I love it, the to-do list. That's my favorite. That's yeah. like my best friend gets. So I think intentionality is so important. It's, we've talked about that a lot. Intentionality, just being purposeful about the way you go about your day and what you do, how you train, how you study, how you complete a task, just being purposeful. And it really, a prerequisite of intentionality, I think, is absolutely planning. You have to plan. 
and you have to plan ahead. And that is not, I would say, I think it's fair to say that that's not a typical art artist trait is to it, on, on the whole in general, everybody's different, of course, but I think in general, a lot of artistic people are, uh, are viewed as sort of fly by the seat of their pants. And I think we tend to be a little bit more like that as a whole group than others, but you really have to be intentional. You have to plan. You have to think ahead. And and you, you even talked about that, Bobby. What was it we were talking about? You said you planned for spontaneity. Is that, is that what we were saying the other day? Yes. <laughs> it sounds so I ridiculous. It. But, you know. It's true. Ah, just said you it have again. to. We should have like a jar <laughs> yeah, we just have... for you knows. And put a dollar in every time. Click, yeah. We're gonna get get like so. Yes, especially when I'm busy, especially when everything is urgent, kind of thing. It's really great for me, anyways, and I'm sure it work for other people as well. That you put into your schedule times to just be spontaneous. So you have to stop what you're doing. You have to stop all that urgent stuff, and you sit there and you go, okay. What kind of spontaneous thing can I do right now? I'll get K and we'll go to, you know, oh, gah! just said it again, but <laughs> do, something, it, uh, do something, do <laughs> something special. <clears throat> the well, other yeah. thing, the other thing, uh, you, talking about those, you knows and t- saying them too much. The other thing I'm trying to do for the last two weeks is go on a negative thoughts diet i i listened to uh some sort of interview with tony robbins i think it was and he was talking about trying to go on a negative thoughts diet so not even saying negative things try not to have any negative thoughts for 10 days just doing one freaking day oh super difficult it's so hard especially when i'm driving <laughs> yep. You strike yeah, you... me as someone who would who would be a frustrated driver. <laughs> I can see that. I can see that. I Especially am, now that I'm you have so a lot quick to on do. the horn. Yeah, I'm so quick on the horn. <laughs> but then this morning, I caught myself. There's a woman turning super slow, and I'm going straight ahead, and I had to put on the brakes. <laughs> and instead of thinking any negative thoughts, I just thought, huh. She's starting to slow down. And that was it. So I was, I was very proud of myself for that. My mom is the best with that. She literally, I'll be in the car and something like that will happen. And I'll say, what is wrong with this person? Why You're getting on a highway. You have to speed up to merge or something <laughs> like that. And she'll say, John, maybe their eyesight's not the greatest. Or maybe... maybe their kids are acting up in the back of the car and they mm. were caught up with it. And she says all these things. <laughs> Stop being reasonable, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Giving the benefit of the doubt. Now, somebody's <laughs> saying in the comments, they're saying, you can't control your thoughts, which I, I have to answer that because, yes, you can. It just takes being a lot more aware, you know, mm-hmm. self-aware of what is going on, how you're being, how you're feeling. And there's some times where, like, I'll wake up in the morning and I feel upset. You know, I just feel cranky. Right. right. And so I'll notice that and I'll go, huh, that's interesting. I'm feeling cranky for no reason. I might tell Kay as well. For some reason, I feel cranky <laughs> today. But then yeah, I try not to nice. do cranky things, right? So you yeah. can control your thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah, I think you can. Tr- oh, go ahead, Masai. Go oh, no, I was just about to say, uh, I read this um, thing where, you know, initial thoughts is what we think about what it's like what we're conditioned to think about but what we think right Mm -hmm. after that is who define like how it defines us so like even though in in the initial thought you're like oh this person is that but then when you catch yourself and when you rethink it like you know thinking like oh maybe this person just woke up so they're they're not driving the best that's i think you know that's what kind of makes you a good person so like yeah so totally you can um control your thoughts Something right, that's like the choice um, part of it. There was something where the Dalai Lama had his uh, brain waves scanned and things like that, and he was on like level ten of happiness. You Interesting. Know? And I believe 
that he's pretty much like that all the time because he's always being very aware. Mm. I think that's the key. But also that plays into art as well because art is very much a mind kind of exercise. It's just right. that you know you get the pain out with your hands, but you're thinking way more, right? There's way more energy spent on thinking. So if you sure. can kind of control your thoughts, then what you can do with art is you can try to control your thoughts in a way where you're looking at your painting like as if you've never seen it before. And you're looking at it from fresh eyes, from the viewer's point of view, and seeing how does, how does your art look to you now. Things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It, it definitely is a mental thing. And actually, your slant or your personality will come out in your work regardless of whether you mean it to or not. When I had students applying to study with me or different things like that over the years, I would take a look at their portfolio and pretty much I would know what their personality was. You'd see a lot of hard edges. You'd see a lot of very crisp lines and overly defined things. And typically that's going to be a little bit more of an anal retentive person and they're going to be a little bit more structured they're going to be less likely to take risks and you know it's interesting it, it definitely comes out so what you in order for your art to change you need to think differently like like you're saying bobby and and understand that that mental part of the process is so key and learning to master that and control that what's happening that's that's a big part of of learning art now I did want to touch on one more organization thing because I've been kind of searching for the right way to do this. How do you organize your files or how do you organize your reference? Mm. I want to know that answer too. <laughs> yeah, I've been searching. I, I keep asking different people. Uh, one really great way that I heard of is, oh, I forget who said this. But they were saying that they use Pinterest, mm. right? Oh, and they make just idea. tons of boards. So if you have a Claire Wendling drawing of a cat, then that would be pinned onto the drawing board, the Claire Wendling board, the cat's board. Mm. Mm, I like that idea. That's really good. I think um, what I've been slowly starting was like mood boards, where if I see a, a photo or a painting that gives me this... You know, if it's like a calm feeling, a really like dark feeling, I, I separate those. Even though like the color scheme might be completely different from each other. I think it's that initial like in inspiration or like idea that comes out from that. If I have a bunch of those, then I can get, you know, certain references uh, gathered up. That's really great. That's that's more being very specific to what it is you, you want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. The Pinterest idea is more of the general kind of, I'm going to make a giant collection of reference. I'm going to keep adding to it over the years. And so I think both have, you know, a good place in somebody's mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that Pinterest idea. I, I have been thinking about that recently, how to organize my my reference because typically the way I would work would be to have an idea for a painting work up that idea start gathering reference for that and then I keep it all organized with that idea for a painting but I can't get access to that later and pull from that reference again if I need it so something like that where it, it cross references in a number of different ways cats clouds you know whatever it might be it, that would be a fantastic option. I would absolutely love that. I need to start doing that. Another really great one that was just hilarious was uh, Philip Boutte Jr. He does the costume illustrations for like every kind of Marvel movie from the Fox Marvel movies to Sony to the Marvel Studios Marvel movies to Inception to everything. And he wow. was saying, I was saying, where is your secret place? to get <laughs> reference and he said he said the freaking library i thought that was hilarious 
That's great. Right? Because all of a sudden now, decades later, the secret place to find reference that nobody really thinks about anymore is the library. That's really true. And he was saying, (laughs) I was like, well, what's the difference? You could go on the internet and things like that. And he's like, yeah, but if you go to the library, you can get 1950s magazines that were printed in 1950s Mm. and look at the real deal, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. see how it was and things like that. I thought that was kind of brilliant that is brilliant also hilarious yeah (laughs) that is that is it's great because i could just see a whole bunch of new artists thinking i'm not doing that (laughs) yeah because also you know nowadays i'm sure this has happened to you where you see somebody's painting and maybe it's a sheepdog or something like that and you recognize where they got the reference from because it's like the first thing that pops up in google when you look Mm -hmm. up sheepdog Mm -hmm. that's right that's exactly right and you may have used a piece of that for something else. Exactly. And yeah, yeah, totally. I've, I've, that's happened to me. You, have, you probably have to be careful of that, don't you, Bobby? If you're making art for a movie or something like that, that's going to be uh, something that you know is potentially copyright material and things like that. You have to be careful that someone can't trace that back, or I guess you're changing it enough. Well, that's why I. Yes, uh, absolutely. That's why I don't i make sure i don't copy any photos right. at all it's always right. kind of interpreted mm-hmm. uh you know thought about in the mind and then regurgitated on the canvas i guess right mm-hmm. right yeah you have to because it you know if somebody did somebody did if a photographer did take all the time to go through that all the lighting and then you kind of rip that off that's <laughs> i'd be mad too if somebody mm. Use that, and it ends up on the end of on the on a billboard or on something. No, yeah, yeah, I took that picture. As we're talking, of course, we have the wonderful uh, community on YouTube on my channel there, asking all sorts of questions. So I want to go to some of the questions here. Blim Blam asks, "Do you, as professionals, <laughs> spend a lot of time each day making studies in sketchbooks?" I need to do it more. I go through spurts where I'll work in my sketchbook, work in my sketchbook, and then I'll have times where I don't do it that much. But I need it to be more of a daily thing that that I do. I, I've been thinking about that even more and more lately. I did the Inktober this year, this past year, and it was awesome. And it, it opened my eyes to the joys of that. And it does take a lot of time, but... I, I I think I need to do it more. How often do you study in general? Just studying for the sake of studying, not studying, you know, this object because I'm going to paint it, I'm going to take the painting and sell it. Right. Well, for me, I have I have this whole, you know, I, I started with more of the fine art based skill set and I'm pushing more into the imaginative territory now. So I'm in the throes of all that. So I'm studying a lot right now because it's a it's sort of a new direction that I'm heading in so that's that's pretty much a part of my daily routine even if it's a very short amount I have books strewn out I have Scott Robertson's books strewn out I have some figure books and different things <laughs> all all in different areas of my studio in the house and and I grab one and and sit in bed next to my wife and do that or or something like that you know, pretty much every day what about you Missy? How often do you study for the sake of just studying right now? Right now, I would like to do it more than I am right now, but probably maybe once or twice a week for a couple hours. I do I do end up doing certain studies like um, figure studies, hand studies. When I realize in my paintings or my drawings that I'm lacking in that area, then I'm like, okay, I have to stay, step a, take a step back and kind of go back to studying and do fundamentals if I want to apply that into my my uh, artwork. I don't know about you guys, but I remember when I really stunk um, and I'm trying to learn and there's like this evolution that happens over like a short period of time. And what happens is I'm not studying a whole bunch of stuff. I'm literally just studying like one or two poses or one or two things and just studying the heck out of it until I've 
kind of extrapolated every little tiny bit of information I could get from it. So in other words, copying it, and then the next day, copying it without looking at it, then looking at it and copying it again, then mm. trying to draw the mirror image of it, then, you know, uh, changing the hand into a claw, into whatever, and just over and over and over and over again. Wow. Obsessive. And that's why I, I feel like, overall, I, I am a slow learner. It's just, I can be very methodical, so I do learn the stuff. Mm -hmm. Very thorough. I like that. Yeah, that that sort of methodology is, is great. I think that's fantastic. I, I lean more towards that as well. And it's funny that you say it that way because I feel the same way. I feel, I've always said it, it feels like it takes me twice as long to learn something as, as everyone else, but that I'm just willing to have the patience to, to do it twice as long. <laughs> and so... So, well, yeah, and when you look at old masters and things like that in museums, and if they do have the sketches there as well, you see multiple yeah. sketches, right? Just tons totally. of studies before they actually paint the painting. And that's what many of them had in common. But then you look at a lot of artists now, and they're all about concept art, speed painting, you know, it's just like, boom, boom, boom. I, it took me 30 <laughs> seconds. I did it one time and I'm through with it. I'm, uh, you know, I'm painting fish now and now I'm painting uh, aliens. And they right. just move on from that subject so quick. And I wonder, I wonder, you know, is, is that possibly a good thing? It doesn't really seem like it's that good of a thing. It feels like kind of like when you waste food, you take a bite out of one big steak and then you just leave it. <laughs> right. There's so much more info there. Mm -hmm. Don't waste the good food, I think. Right. I, I agree. I agree. I mean, you're talking to somebody, of course, who <laughs> my my training was was a month and a half on one drawing. So... <laughs> People That's thought true. that was nuts. People thought that was nuts from the concept art world. They couldn't believe I was doing that. They would look at my updates and say, how are you working on one drawing for four weeks, five weeks? And I, I would always say, well, I could probably work for three more months on this drawing. There's a lot to, <laughs> a lot to learn. But it does get to a point where it, it, uh, you do hit a stopping point where you're not really learning what, what you're putting out, the amount of effort you're putting out isn't equal to the amount that you're learning, but proportionately. But I think, uh, I think having a good balance is really key. And I've, I've always told people you have to have a good balance of shorter studies that showcase what you're learning. And you can, you can really gauge yourself that way to see where, where you naturally lean and what you do sort of by nature and then also have longer studies where you can really dive into things and sink your teeth in like you were saying and and really study it it makes a huge difference i i agree with you i think i've learned i've learned probably the most on from things that have taken me a little bit longer mm. oh. so let, it, me, let me pose this question to both of you guys is this a true statement that the biggest evolutions in learning come from doing boring so so-called quote-unquote boring things i think so i know everybody doesn't want to hear that but i i think so i i and i think that is not just with art i think that goes with a lot of uh, that that works for also a lot of disciplines and i was reading a, a book recently there's a, a physicist who was talking about different things and he told the story of the scientist who he was a biologist and he went in college and his first semester he was working with this one instructor who was really well known for being a great instructor and he said i want to be a biologist and i want to do really well and he said okay well take a look at this fish in this jar and give me 20 observations and come back the next week so he got 20 observations and he came back he said they need to be valid observations too not just i like this or something like that it needed to be actually scientifically helpful observations so he came back with 20 and then he told him to do 20 more and he came back with 20 more and he said do 20 more <laughs> he said do 100 more one time so by the time the guy was done he had 240 260 observations about this fish floating in formaldehyde 
And it really pushed him to pay attention to what was there. And he said, you know, you can't be a biologist if you don't pay attention to what's there and if you don't really think about what's there. I thought that was a really interesting, it was a true story too. I thought it was really interesting. And he asked him, said, how many have you found? He said, my max is 689 or something like that. <laughs> and, wow. and, you know, it was, where's the fin located? You know, is it spiky? Is it, what about the scales? And then you, you observe and you, you see what makes that particular fish distinct from other types of fish. And then, and really, that's the heart of being a biologist is notice, noticing those things and all that. So I thought that was really interesting. And I think it, that story kind of applies to us as artists, too. Like you said, it, it's we live in a society where it's just flip the channel, flip the channel, flip the channel. You know, it's everything is a two minute sound bite, and, you know, nobody reads War and Peace anymore. <laughs> Especially this generation. You know, this generation yeah. has the least kind of, or it, that's what they say that this generation has the least amount of uh, attention span mm. right so if right. you are cool with and if you can start to love boring things mm -hmm. right then you also have a huge advantage you do you do right. and it's and you build real skill there there's skill that looks it, it looks maybe flashy or it, it you know let's say you have one particular technique of something that you do in photoshop and you do that for your art and and everybody likes that and all that, but it's just your one technique and you might not even be sure why you're doing it. You're just doing it because you know it turns out looking good, but you don't understand the reasoning behind it. You don't understand. Uh, it would be kind of similar to following directions of how to fix your car, but never understanding why and what, why that was happening and what, what mechanism is causing this to break or, or how a car actually works. If you understand how a car actually works, you can modify it, change it, tweak it. You, you'll, you'll, come up with solutions to the problems way way more quickly it's the same with art you, you have to understand the way it works and you have to do the boring things a lot of times to understand all that foundational material and build up that big solid foundation that you can uh, then stand on i think i agree with you right on let's go to another question aaron asks i've heard you guys talk about Fear of failure in the past. What are your thoughts on the opposite? Fear of success. I get nervous when my art does well and when opportunities arise. Hmm. Hmm. Any thoughts on this? You know, Massey, you, you're, when you came to us, you, you were in like second year of college or yeah. something like that. Yeah. You finished second year of college, never went back. And, uh, <laughs> things have just been kind of excelling at a pretty strong rate. Yeah. Maybe, do you have any thoughts on this? I, You're I have. You're getting good, Masai. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, no, there is, there is definitely a fear of success. Like when, when it's like said like that, it's kind of, it sounds funny because like, why would you be scared of success? But it's also like, it's nerve wracking for me because for me, it's more of like, can I perform? Can I execute um, the work that needs to that needs to get done? Am I gonna be able to do what I've been doing before, or even better? So I think it's like, when I'm rising this high, I'm just scared that it's gonna go down all of a sudden because it's been going up like at such a good, consistent um, rise. Or when you get a really good opportunity sometimes you feel like you're not ready for it, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> exactly. That gets really scary, too. It gets very scary. But, I mean, yeah. I guess I have, you know, you and Kay to kind of help support me and <laughs> kind of guide me along, which is really nice. And I'm Or we say the same it. thing, and then you're like, oh, okay, you're normal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's normal. I, I think I, if I was Bobby and Tim Burton called me and said, I want you to design creatures. I know it probably wasn't him that called you, but you know, I want to design creatures for, you know, Alice in Wonderland. I, I, <laughs> I would, I would get nervous. I would get nervous probably every time for sure. And you, it's funny because the first time I did a, a gallery show and the first time somebody bought my painting, I had to play it off like, okay, yeah, I, I, I'm used to this and all of that. But inside I was freaking out and I didn't know what, <laughs> You know, I didn't know what to say. And I remember having to kind of, when people asked me the cost of my painting, I knew it was the right cost for the painting, 
But when people asked me how much it cost at the show or whatever, or, or just talking about it, I would have to kind of steal myself and then tell them, yes, this is how much it costs in a confident way because it was hard. It was hard to, even though I thought it was worth it, I don't know why I had difficulty doing that. But now, now it's, now it's the opposite. Probably, uh, you know, I'd probably a little too dismissive where I should be, a little, <laughs> but, but you know, it's hard. It's definitely hard to, I think, especially when you're, you're growing and you're, you're learning and especially when you start to see how much you need to grow and, and that, that never changes. You always need to get better and you have to get to a certain point where you can trust the people around you that are professionals or th- different things like that. You know, if Bobby's saying to you, say, you can do this, then you can probably pretty much trust that you can because mm-hmm. he's closely observing you and, and things like that. And, and, to be totally honest, most people are are functioning under the fake it till you make it anyways. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> scared all the time. Everybody doesn't know if they can do it. Oh, uh, that's pretty much how everyone feels. I think there's people that are honest about it, people that aren't honest about it. Mm. Yeah, but you don't, you... I don't even know when you actually get over this because literally right? just yeah. <laughs> this morning in the elevator, I was just thinking, man, I can't draw at all. <laughs> I swear, I was just thinking that like, ah. Oh. What am I doing? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, for sure. For sure. But for the sure. other thing is that nervousness and excitement, they are pretty much, they're so closely related. You know, so if you just kind right. of steer the energy towards excitement and you say, no, I'm not nervous, I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then, I think then it that's gets better. how I feel. When I get scared, I'm just like, okay, bring it. <laughs> like, I can do this. I just, you know, have to, yeah, switch the fear to excitement. When I go on a roller coaster, it's the exact same thing. What, uh, I'm trying to put on the brave face. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I need to scream. I need to scream and try to make it like screaming in excitement to get me through <laughs> it. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah. Let's go on to you, Oh, sorry. Go okay. ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if you put in the time, though, and your problem-solving abilities are there, then, you know, have some confidence in that as well. Have some confidence in the fact that you can get it done. You can you can achieve it. Because you did all these other procedure. things. Confidence in the procedure. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I like That's that. Mm-hmm. I yeah. constantly think about that when I'm not feeling super confident. I go, okay, well, I know the procedure is solid. Let's go through all the little steps. Right, right. Let's go on to another question. So, Raw Green says, uh, asks, is there anything you've struggled with as an artist and how long or how did you tackle the problem as an artist? Any examples you guys have that come to mind, stuff that you've struggled with? And how did you tackle it? There's a lot. <laughs> I think probably the biggest thing is uh, art block, which everyone kind of goes through. Mm, that's a good one. How'd that's, you get over it? That, for, I think it's very different for everyone, but for me, I kind of, I like to step back a bit and, you know, kind of live my life doing other stuff. Like, uh, I go, I do a lot of rock climbing. Um, that, you know, that puts my mind in a completely different state. I like to go, uh, running. Um, you know, I play ultimate frisbee as well. Just things that kind of like, I think a lot of things is like, you know, physical activity. So it kind of like flows the blood through my mind as well as like take my mind off of art. So when I come back, I have like a completely fresh mind. And then when I sit down, I'm like, okay, I've like, I miss doing this or like, oh, I was think as I was doing all this stuff, I was, I might want to do this. So I think for me, it's just, you know, doing something that's a bit different and just, you know, keep your body moving. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's good. I think if you have block, I think everybody, uh, artists do have block. They're not sure. There's, I, I've always thought about that in regards to what is causing the block. And typically it's a looping of ideas. You're looping back to the same ideas or the same things and you can't get out of it. So to get out of it, you have to see something different, experience something different, do something different. I think that's a really good way, I must say, that what you were describing to break mm-hmm. up your thought process and I I really think if somebody's struggling with ideas and different things like that, I would tell them to get out of their studio and go do something interesting. And then all of a sudden you start to see something. Go look at bugs in the woods or go 
do something. It doesn't have to cost money or you don't have to go skydive or, you know, or something like that. Although that would probably give you some ideas too. <laughs> but, but, you know, just something to break the cycle of thinking. Try something new. Try something new and talk to people. Get their perspective. Get their, really, if you're existing in the world and you're paying attention and you're interested in learning as a person, there, there should be too much. You should feel like, like there's so much that you, you couldn't possibly do it all. So when you're starting to feel like that, I feel like it's, it's becoming insulated and it's a looping of the ideas. I think that's happening. At least that's the way it's helped. What's helped me. A big one for me lately has been, I request to meet up with the director or whatever, uh, before we're, we're planning on starting like two days before we're starting, three days before we're starting. Give me the pitch then. Let me kind of marinate on it, you know, and just have like two or three days where if I can, I'm just going to relax and just cruise the internet, look through my books, even if it's unrelated, right? Like if the project is a family of monsters, you could look at underwater uh, books and then you find the sheephead fish and you're like, oh, the sheephead fish actually changes sexes when it gets older. And it's like, wow, that's so weird. I wonder how that can be incorporated into this thing that I'm working on. Mm. Right. They have human teeth, don't they too? They have human looking teeth, sheephead fish. They're pretty strange. They're pretty strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like the the male dominant sheephead fish has this big bulbous um bump on its head like or something forehead. and then the, the girls don't but then when the girls get old enough then they will start to grow that or not that's okay, weird this is like a bobby fact so you really need to <laughs> like, look it up and see <laughs> what is the <laughs> true right. thing but from what i remember it's like there are selected amounts of these uh, female sheephead fish that will grow really big and then all of a sudden start to grow this big bulbous bump and then uh, the males know that that girl is now a guy, and the girl. So the guys sudden... become curvaceous, is what mm. you're saying. The guys get the curves. <laughs> the the sheephead fish, it's it's opposite. Like you see a bunch of curves, you're like, no, that's a dude. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but it, it's it's just kind of weird, you know. Like if that was your life cycle. What kind of interesting story would come out of that? <laughs> like it's if, Mercedes, true. if you grew up, you know, 20 more years and you're going to become a guy, like how would that affect your thinking and your life? That's and so stuff? weird. I never thought of it. Yeah, it's weird. Right? That, yeah, it's interesting that you, and that you would slowly sort of progress towards that is a very interesting thing. You're right. That does bring up a whole host of, of interesting story <laughs> yeah, ideas so and just funny cruise, things too. Just cruise, you know, look at whatever and try to always relate it back to that question to that problem or whatever it mm. is and then the other one is when i'm really stumped and i just i'm having the worst art block in the world i'll just try to learn something new because once you learn something new all of a sudden yeah. you got a new tool in your tool belt so now you can make new things mm. mm -hmm. i like that let's go on to another question karabo matsuo how do you find the motivation to finish a piece when you're already unhappy with what you think the outcome will be when it's in progress? Do you start just start over? I don't know about you guys, but in every good piece that I have, there is always a point where I literally think maybe I should start <laughs> over. Uh, <yeah. laughs> so true. I don't so know if true. it's like because it's a challenging kind of topic or something like that. That's why it's going to be one of my, you know, best pieces or whatever. Mm. And that's also why I want to give up at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys want to speak about that at all? I, I definitely feel like that with every single painting. Same. I feel like that. <laughs> uh, you feel like that too, Masai, oh, with every yeah. painting? Yep. Yeah. That must be a common thing because there's a point that I cross and I think on the painting that I'm doing on here on the video, probably about 10 minutes ago was that point where I was thinking, is this going to work? It's mm. not going to, because this isn't a perfect painting by the, even by the end, it's not, you know, there's things that I don't like about it, but, uh, but 
I was wondering at that point, do I need to start over? I was thinking that same thing. This, did I mess up the structure? Did I do this? And I had to adjust. I had to stop, adjust some things, move the eyes and, and, and change a bunch of things. And I always feel like that. I always feel at some point in the process, this idea is stupid and my execution is bad and I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I should just quit, you know, redo it. Well, the cool thing about this painting is that you didn't speed it up. This is real time, isn't it? This is real time. Yes, this is real time. Yeah. So, I tried I was looking at the clock trying to trying to get, you know, as much done as I could by exactly an hour. Yeah. <laughs> so that would be a really cool exercise for people as well. If you are stumped, try to just paint this painting in an hour. Hmm. Right, and you can look up and see. Oh, okay, John's ahead of me, or oh, I'm, I'm beating John. Okay, okay, you know, and just kind of <laughs> yeah. focus on that. That would be cool. I would like to see people's uh, people's work when they do that. I want 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 to see them do it. Well, if you do do yeah. it, you could tag John. Yeah. Uh, on his Instagram, there, John Hardesty. It's on the uh, screen. For sure. That'd um, be great. But yeah, for that question, um, for me, I think the best painting that came out that I, I came out with is one that I actually redid three or four times. Mm. Like I've painted it, I've got the shading and some of the the colors down and I'm like, I need to restart this. So I start from scratch and um, I, Bobby, you know this painting, it's like this little seahorse turtle creature with oh, the little yeah, yeah. shell. I've, I've done that three or four, redone it like from scratch from the base drawing because it's like, I know the ideas there. I, I know like what I want it to look like. It's just like every time I paint it and when I start over, I learn that like, I always learn something new. So I right. think, I mean, if it's a personal, uh, painting, then I think it's okay to just start from scratch and then, you know, just take from, take what you learn from the previous painting and just apply it to that because anything for me I've, i have a lot of paintings that don't see the light of day <laughs> but like sure. i always learn something new so as long as it's um you know you just keep going and doing a bunch of paintings then i think that's what like helps me motivate to i don't know if it answers the question properly but that's what helps me to motivate to uh finish certain paintings i am um... Oh, oh, go ahead, Bobby. Did you want to say something? Oh, I was just, I was thinking at lunch today, I was thinking everybody posts all their best stuff, all the best sides of them, you know, when they're looking the best, that's the stuff that they put up. And I was just thinking this morning, I was just thinking, you know what, I kind of want to just put my worst stuff, how I, you know, when I look the worst, when I'm painting the worst, <laughs> you know, and then I started to think, wow, how would that look? No. That that's just horrible. <laughs> I would probably lose like friends, not just followers, but friends. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, I had to go back to that that question too. I had to deal with that over the years with students when they'd want to restart. And they would ask me, should I restart? Should I not restart? And I always I am I was always fine with students restarting. If they diagnosed the problem properly and understood what to do right the next time. So I think one of the key things just to dovetail or just to whatever on, on uh, to add to that, I think I would say make sure that if you start over that it's not just an exercise at, that you're completing out of frustration. Like let me just restart so I can have that nice feeling at the beginning where nothing matters. You know, it, that that's a, that's a great feeling at the beginning when when nothing matters and you can put down strokes freely and. You, you haven't yet adjusted too much yet. I think you need to diagnose what went wrong, exactly why it went wrong, and how you're going to do it differently the next time if you start over. That That's key, I think. Mm -hmm. One practice that I love is uh, starting a painting, thinking th that this painting doesn't matter, because at the end of it, I'm going to just delete it. Because mm. just like Massey was saying, it's almost always the second, third, fourth try is always right. going to be way better because also decisiveness is something that attracts the eye, whether you know it or not. Right. You see like minimal brush strokes in a painting, but it just looks brilliant from far away or whatever. That kind of stuff is beautiful, not just right. in its overall appearance, but in its knowledge. Right. And when you paint right. a painting once and you paint it again, 
you're going to be a lot more economical. You're going to know every step. You're going to have a lot of questions answered. So that's another True. really great way of dealing with things. You know, paint it once, just thinking, I'm just going to just bulldoze right through this. It's going to be horrible. And at the end, I'm going to delete it. And then the next one is probably the one that you're going to keep. Mm-hmm. I like that. Why don't we go on to another question here? Let's see. Are you addicted? To, okay, so this is Roy Black saying, uh, are you addicted to the anxiety and excitement to do big, costly projects? <laughs> huh, that's a really interesting question. I've never, ever had that question asked before. I think I am. Uh, I think, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, you kind of get into it. I remember, yep. for example, uh, working on, working on Alice in Wonderland, but you know, that was like the biggest thing we ever worked on because nobody expected the success that it had and getting the call. Um, oh, uh, Tim Burton is meeting Johnny Depp over the weekend. He's going to talk to him about the movie. Can you paint a painting of Johnny Depp as the Mad Hatter? <laughs> and then we're like, oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. And I, we get right on it. It's super exciting. And the Monday, it's announced in the newspaper Johnny Depp signed on for the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. And you, you're sitting there thinking, wow, I'm in Toronto, but I affected that at least a right. little bit. Right. Right. Oh, sure. Most you likely it didn't it. it didn't even matter what the heck he had to show. It's Tim Burton, Johnny Depp. They've been doing stuff for years and yeah. he probably would have signed on anyways. But just knowing mm-hmm. that you mm-hmm. had that little slice of uh, influence. Well, at the very cool. least, I would say you could have messed it up. You could have made it to where he thought, no, that's, I don't want to do that. That doesn't, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a very, it, it, if anything, Johnny Depp was like, yep, this is great. Just like I'd expect that kind of a thing. Uh, you, you know, so I think, I think, yeah, that you definitely had a, a big effect on that. It's pretty cool. Who knows? Probably not. <laughs> because in the end, uh, the Mad Hatter looked very different from the concept that I put together or K and I put together. But it was still super cool. Yeah, that was cool. It, was, it looked cool. Now, I also wanted to just ask a question about uh, your texture class that's coming out. Yeah. Yeah, I see, like, you started off with these very simplified brush strokes and things like that, especially for the hair in this painting. Mm-hmm. And now it looks like freaking hair. Right. So what are your like main thoughts when you are um, tackling texture? How do you kind of categorize texture, perhaps? How do you kind of dissect it and kind of rebuild it? What's what's the thinking process and how does that kind of relate to your class? Yeah, there's a there's a number of different ways to to break it down. But I I I'll try to give a quick a, a quicker overview of it. But it does go a little bit further than I could probably, I'd be talking for a long time, but, but it does break down to some simple things. When, when I was studying textures and, and what kind of drove the need for the class or the desire for the class was I, I wanted to, I would look at different artists work and I would see really efficient brushstrokes, like you said. And, and it was a really interesting way that you said that because you said it implied knowledge when you'd see these brushstrokes because it was very simplified. And I thought, wow, they know what is essential. They know what is required to convey that particular texture. And they were able to do it in this simple way with just a couple strokes. I want to be able to do that. So I started to think about how to break down textures. So I have a number of different categories. And, and I, in the class, I, I, I talk about classifying things. So classifying the texture. So how much of a gloss level is there? What's the silhouette? What's the silhouette? What is the edge breakup between the lights and the darks and between the different value shapes? What are the edge, you know, what's the edge breakup happening there? What's the local color? You know, is that, is that important? Well, definitely if you want to convey gold, uh, gold is going to be one of the first ones that 
in, in the section with the first ones that comes out. And if you paint gold green, you can have all the same qualities, but no one will necessarily think that was that's gold. They'll think it's a metal, but they won't think it's gold. And so there's certain things that are required to convey the information to the viewer about a, about a texture. And for me in the class, it's not as much scientific about, you know, discussing what's happening on, on a scientific level and understanding it that way. It's more about understanding visually what you need to describe that. So for instance, in the hair here, what I'm seeing is, uh, a, a very specific transition between the lights and the mid range values and then the mid range values and the darks. I wish I could point on this right now, but, but I'll try to describe it as best I can. But think about if you were to take, this is an easy way to say it. Think about if I were to take this hair and take a hard edge brush and make it like a helmet on the top, very, very crisp on the edge with no, uh, fuzziness looking on the, on the silhouette of his head. It wouldn't look like hair. The inside section, those rougher strokes that are on the inside that that on their own look very abstract but make sense in the context, those wouldn't make any sense if we didn't have that broken up texture just even around the silhouette of the hair. If we didn't have that, it wouldn't convey that that was hair. So there's a number of, of things like that that you can employ once you understand how to break down those textures and and simplify them really in your in your mind uh, what what makes one thing distinct from another you can then turn those switches on and say okay how can i do that in the simplest with the simplest brush strokes and how can i, I after studying textures for a while now I, i'm beginning to really understand how some of these hero artists of mine can do that because it it once you break it down and you take it apart you know how they put it back together you can understand how they how they did that so that, if that makes sense is, is that a is that a i'm trying to no, trying to wonderful. keep it it's generalized without having to go into too much because it you know there's lots of different ways to classify them but the main idea is, is and this is what i talk about in the class is to break down textures into manageable categories that each you can evaluate with each check texture so if slime is there it, what's different about slime if, if something has slime on it what's different about that than just being wet with water, right? Mm. Why Why is that different? There are a number of physical manifestations. Obviously, when we look at it, we can tell the difference. When we look at it, you know, with our eyes, we say, well, that's slime, that's water. We know the difference. Then you have to get to why. You have to understand why. What is, how do we break that down? How do we separate that visually? And then once we understand how to separate that visually, then you've unlocked the key. Then you've Then you can say, Ah, yes. Now I know how to, if you reverse engineer it, you can say, now I know how to create something that looks like it has slime on it as opposed to just having water. Yeah, I so. can't wait for that class to come out. It's not out yet, but John's working hard at it. And, That's right. I'm uh, working today on it. Fantastic. <laughs> now, yeah. we've been talking a little bit throughout the conversation here on the stream about what the masters did, what our heroes did, how we learned from them. And so when I was a student, when I was a student, I had my heroes. I had my heroes of uh, character design, Peter DeSev, uh, drawers like Claire Wendling, my painting hero, Craig Mullins. Oh, yeah. Craig Mullins, goodbrush.com. Oh, yeah. He blew my mind. He had these tutorials on Saijin. At the oh, time, yeah, I remember that. Forums, <laughs> that it just had like a billion comments, and uh, and he just talked about just painting cubes. I remember it was so kind of fundamental or or mm -hmm. basic, if you will. But he took that just that simple topic of cubes to the the nth degree, and it was so amazing. Um, been after that tried to kind of track him down for many years talked with him on the internet just exchanging emails just small little things you know once a year or something like that are you interested in teaching craig no no i'm not you know and i i got too much to do i got too much to do but there is something to be said about having time on your side so many things are possible. 
So I'm super happy to tell everybody, I mentioned it in the last stream, but one of my ultimate, ultimate, ultimate artistic hero of artistic heroes, Craig Mullins, has finished his very first course for schoolism, and it opens on Monday, so April good. 16th. It's going to be fantastic. I've already watched five lessons, and it just, every lesson, I just want to think about it for like a week. <laughs> That's how awesome it is. Um, it's an opportunity of a lifetime, highly recommended. I just want to awesome. mention it, so in case you are interested, that you won't miss out as well. He will have a few spots open for critique sessions where you do the assignments and the godfather of digital painting himself will see your stuff, paint over top of it, talking to you about what you, know, you need to do to level up, how he would do it, everything. What an opportunity. So just want to mention that real quick. So cool. Yeah, he really is. He's kind of the he's kind of like what Paul McCartney is or Michael Jackson or something in the music world that's or Michael Jordan in the basketball world that's kind of <laughs> I would see even even more because he is literally the first Photoshop digital painter. Yeah, you're right. right. You're right. So it's like, okay, I I made these oil paints. I just invented oil paints. I'm going to give it to a person <laughs> that ends up right. being the best oil painter in the world. Right. right. <laughs> what are the chances? Right? right? Because he got he got uh Photoshop or whatever. He got that um before it was for sale. Oh, really? Yes. Interesting. Yes. That's pretty darn amazing. And he did it with his mouse, right? He just used a mouse and like a round brush, right? Right, right. For years, he only yeah. used a freaking... <laughs> I can't even believe it. Like, even when the the thing was invented, even when... Um, even when Photoshop was invented and, and the tablet came out for years, he was still on the mouse for years. So and awesome. he was still painting better than all of us. Right. That's so good. I love it. I love it. It's so, the best. It's it's yeah. like when a master swordsman in the martial arts movies picks up a stick and just whoops up on everybody. Everyone else has swords and he or she has a stick. Yeah. <laughs> just take it, that's pretty much how it is. <laughs> I, I think this person, you know, Craig is going to go down in art history, or at least he should. Right. Can you imagine the scorn he took at first for painting digitally back when no one was doing it? I bet you he took a lot of scorn for that. People saying it was going to go nowhere or that it was stupid or I That's bet you. That's a really great question. And mm -hmm. actually on Monday, I'm, I've convinced him to do a live stream Yay. on the stream here. <laughs> so you needed a guest, right? Bobby, you need a guest. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to be listening. It's fine. <laughs> I'm just joking. Oh, man. I, I think everybody's going to be listening because yeah. uh, it's his very first live stream. Um, and that's going to be very exciting. Awesome. So good. Anyhow, uh, I know you're a busy person, John, and you're sure. working on your class and everything. I want to right. thank you. And I want to thank Masse. I want to thank the people that joined us for the stream. It was wonderful watching you paint and reconnecting again. Do you have any last kind of uh, anything that I missed that you want to tell the audience, John? I don't think so. Just thank you guys for being here and uh, keep painting, uh, keep going and work hard. Be consistent. Awesome. Some people are asking when is that Craig Mullins live stream going to happen? We've slotted it. We've scheduled it for 3 p.m. Eastern time on Monday. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful day and we will see you on Friday, hopefully. Bye. Take care, guys.